Okay, good evening, Rabbi Good evening. Welcome to another session of our classes Tuesday nights. You know, I was thinking what to speak about that will fit really the awesome time, the period of time of approaching Shavuot in less than 10 days. And also with our parasha that so heavily focuses on the topic of the Kohanim and the topic of Kiddush Hashem, so I decided that really, if you ponder and think, all of this are really connected in a very deep and meaningful way. Our parasha speaks very heavily about the mitzvot of a Kohen, the priestly families that we had, several of them working in the Beit HaMikdash, how they cannot become Tameh, they cannot contaminate themselves, and they are warned time and again that they should not, um, they should always sanctify Hashem's name and never desecrate and cause desecration to the name of the Almighty name of Hashem. Now, the truth is, Rav Hirsch asks and answers a phenomenal question. You see, the parasha says that there's a mitzvah of not having a kohen that's ba'almum. A kohen that has any blemishes is pasul to work in Beit HaMikdash. He's, he does not pass. He's not fit for working in the temple in the Beit HaMikdash. And blemish, halakhically speaking, could be even very... Um, slight blemishes that we would not necessarily even think of them as, as a problem, as a physical blemish. And nevertheless, Halakha sees any small blemish, which again, the, the, the uh, enumerating the blemishes is beyond the scope of this talk, but um, even the slight things, some of which are considered a blemish for a Kohen, which would render him unfit for working in Beit HaMikdash. Says Rav Hirsch, why is this? If you have a Kohen that uh, his earlobe is attached, so what? He's a great man. He could be a tremendous tzaddik. Why would he be rendered unfit for Beit HaMikdash? And so phenomenally, Rav Hirsch writes that Hashem wants the people who work in the temple in the Beit HaMikdash to be perfect human beings in every which way. They should be people who naturally others look up to them and they, they see them as the most capable, the most, um, you know, fit for any job that could be in existence. Lest, chas v'shalom, people are going to think, oh, this guy couldn't do anything else. So they recruited him to the Beit HaMikdash. He was a no good. So they brought him, they brought him to the service of the Beit HaMikdash. And really, if you, if you think about it, the Pasuk says it, and the Gemara explains it like this, that HaKohen HaGadol Mechav and the Gemara says in, in Masechet Yuma on page 18, I guess several places in, in, in Shas this is mentioned, Masechet Horayot, page 9, Masechet Chulin, Kuvla Medalet, 32, and 34, and, and, and so on and so forth in the Yerushalmi and Tosefta and other places that a Kohen Gadol has to be the best of the people that you could find. Gadol, it says, Bekoach, he should be the strongest, the tallest, the most handsome, Gadol Benoi. Gadol, and Gadol Bechokhmah, obviously he has to have Chokhmah da Torah, he should be smart, naturally smart and wise man. And Gadol Beosher, even he has to be very rich financially, very capable. And says, the Gemara goes on to say that if the Kohen Gadol, is, it was not, he was not a rich man beforehand, Echav Kohanim, the the rest of the Shevet of Kehuna, they have to, they're obligated to make him rich. Hmm. Before he starts working. Why? And according to the Hirsch, this is very, very beautiful. In, in order to naturally draw the attention and the praise of the people, that they look up to this person as the representative of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. As the ambassador of Hashem in the world, a person has to be a perfect human being. And the truth is, by each one of the Kohanim, the Ramban writes, the beautiful 
beautiful woven with the four different colors with gold and so on and so forth. These are the noblemen's, the, the, the royalty people in, in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, that's what, what, that's what they wore. The Bigdei Keunah were considered the most expensive of everything that you could find out there. So Hashem is saying basically that the presenters of the Torah in the world have to be the most perfect people that they are naturally looked up to by the rest of the nation. And really by each one of the Kohanim, it says you have to make the Aron Achicha Big Dekeuna. It's speaking about Big Dekeuna. Lechavod Ultif Aret. It has to be beautiful and magnificent clothing that they're going to wear. And this, to me, it seems that applies to anything really in the Torah. Any person nowadays that is wearing a yarmulke and is a religious Jew of any form, of any capacity, regardless of if you're wearing a knitted yarmulke or a velvet yarmulke or a white one, a black one, a, we are all ambassadors of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the world. And to carry that world with us with a pride, it becomes the job of our nation. Therefore, I believe it's mentioned many more times by a Kohen who is the representative of HaKadosh Baruch in the world that he should be very extremely careful not to desecrate the name of God, the name of Hashem. Now because of that, the Kohanim have several different rules and regulations, some perks and, and privileges and some restrictions and, and prohibitions how they are to conduct themselves in the um, in, in in the way they marry, in the way they they um, they eat, and so on and so forth, which much of them nowadays do not really apply. We have the, all, all the matanot matanot keuna, the gifts that they were were given to the shevet of kohanim and leviim, with truma and maser and so on and so forth, which were you know extremely valuable in the time of the mikdash. If you, in parentheses, just to mention, someone asked me, he said, Rabbi, what is this new concept of kolel? that they have came up with, that some people learn, others have to support them. I said, the truth of the matter is, this was in, invented about 3,500 years ago by the Torah itself. So he looks at me, he's, you know, and the truth is, I'm, I'm surprised that it, others do, do not say this, that I, I had to come up with this myself. I said, look, we have 13 Shvatim, we have 12, and then Menashe and Ephraim are, are two Shvatim. So 13 Shvatim, 12 of them work, and one of them is Shevet Levi, that Hashem says, you are not working. You don't have land, they didn't own any land. Hashem says, these are the, the 6 or 48, the, the afterwards 42 were added to them, 48 cities of the Leviim. You live in the cities and you teach, the, you, you ought to be the teachers, the professors of Talmud, the teachers of the Torah, and the, the servants of the Beit HaMikdash to, to, to make sure that the service of the temple is going in the optimal way. Now, the other ones, they have to give about 20% of their assets to this Shevet. Now, you have the Master, everyone knows the 10%, but that's only one of the 24 of the gifts of the Kohanim. If you add them up all together, like the Vilna Gaon says, and he writes it even to his, uh, to his wife in the famous letter, the, the, um, the very well-known letter of the Gra that he sent to his family, to his wife, he says, make sure when I'm, when I'm absent, to pay 20% of our income like I was there because anything less than that you're going to be punished and so on. He's very, very strong in this. But let's not say 20%. Even if it's 10%. So 12 Shvatim are paying 10%. How much is that? How many percent? That's 120%. And the rest of the 12 Shvatim themselves are left each with, with what? 90%. Who is richer? The, the, the Shevet Levi are substantial richer than the other ones. Now if you do the real math of about 20% then you end up with three times as much 
right? You, you end up with 80% versus, versus 240%, which is three times as much. Why is God doing this? Doesn't the Mishnah say Pat Bamelach Kachi Darkashel Torah? This is the way you learn Torah. Pat Bamelach Tochal. You have to eat bread and, and, and salt. Ma'im be Masurat Ishte. Measured water. Val Haris Tishan. Vechayesar Tichye. That's how you learn Torah, the Mishnah says. When you absolutely neglect and you don't pay that much attention to the physical. So why does Hashem make them so rich? To which the answer is the same thing that we're discussing now. There is a concept of tzedakah, and then there is a totally separate concept of support of the Torah, which is hachzakah the Torah. Hashem wants that the Torah should be so glorified that Kohanim, whoever is carrying the name of God, the name of Hashem, whoever is the representative and ambassador of Hashem in the world, should be naturally looked up upon, just like the Kohen Gadol, the Torah is a biblical um, mitzvah, it's a biblical commandment, gadelehu mishelechav, they should be the richest of all all, all the Shevet Kuna. Because naturally a person looks up to that and Hashem wants that. Because think to yourself, if all of the um, Talmidei Chachamim are doing well, so people want their kids to become Talmidei Chachamim. If all of them are looked down upon by the society, so no one wants their, their kids to perhaps pursue that um, that mahalach, that way of life. And the difference is just a generation or two, after two generations, you're going to end up with a society that either, if they look up to them, all the brains are going to go to the Torah, and you're gonna have tremendous leaders, wise and smart leaders. And if you don't have it, if they look down upon it, then you're going to end up with, with, with um, leaders of the society that they are not fit for the job that they're doing. So therefore, really the concept of the support for the Torah was built in with the Torah system of, of supporting the Shevet Keuna. And the genius of it, I mean, really we could give a whole shiur on this. The genius of it is that there's a concept of Makare Keuna and Tobat Hana'ah that you do not have obligation to give it to any specific Levi or a Kohen. The society, the Jewish nation chooses which ones are the proper ones to be given to. The ones that the, 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 the community is benefiting from, they're, the, the, they're going to be the beneficiaries of people's maser and other matanot kuna. And the ones who people think they're, they're not worthy, obviously they're going to be left aside. But the concept, the core concept of it is the same thing as Rav Hirsch mentioned so beautifully, that the Torah is very specific, that we should, we should respect ourselves as the ambassadors of Hashem in the world, and the way we would have um, conducted ourselves if we would have a sign, I'm ambassador of Hashem, that should be really the way that we conduct ourselves normally. Now, this is really the, the perks of the keunah that you have them being supported, which doesn't, doesn't really apply nowadays. You have, you know, maybe Pidiona Ben, a few coins, that, which doesn't make that much of a difference, really. And then you have the, you know, the, getting the first Aliyah, and so on and so forth, which Rambam writes, uh, that's in Latin of having a, a be, bigger person in the Torah. So those are for someone that cares about getting the first Aliyah and so on and so forth. But the main um, things of the Kohanim nowadays is really the prohibitions that they have. The two main major ones, one is you know the, the marriage prohibitions, that they cannot marry a divorcee, they cannot marry, ma marry a convert, and several other categories of people that they cannot marry. And the second one is really um, the concept of contamination of two they cannot um, attend funerals, they can touch a dead body, a corpse, and so on and so forth. Which really brings us to a very wide and deep concept and many halachic questions of how we deal with this in 2018, 21st century by, by the um, things that we have nowadays. Can, can a Kohen um, go to the hospital to visit the sick? Can a Kohen that is sick, can a Kohen that, that, that's sick go to a hospital to be treated? Can a Kohen become a, co a doctor? Can a Kohen um, 
fly in an airplane, El Al, which sometimes carries corpse to Eretz Israel. For many people, want their 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 um, um, relatives to be buried in Eretz Israel, and obviously. Um, the uh, recent thing that we had that the airplanes in El Al they flew over Cholon um, cemetery and that became a, a big problem in the um, Israeli rabbinate whether or not it's, it's mutar it's, it's, pro it's prohibited or is maybe allowed to fly for Kohanim with El Al going over the Cholon cemetery and last but not least can a person that's Kohen have an implant or a graft, a, a bone graft of any sort placed in his body when we know that recently all of the, the dental implants and uh, many of the other things that we have are used really from corpse, not, not from the animal tissues that used to be in, in past. So that really becomes a whole series of questions that we have to deal with when dealing with the halachot of Kohanim. And starting with the first, first ones first, that uh, so Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, he asks, he was asked by a rabbi, and he discusses this in the third volume of his Yuridah, in uh, chapter 155, and he says, it's ridiculous even to um, contemplate the concept of a Kohen becoming a, a doctor because how can you be um, allowing a person to come in contact with dead bodies and so on and so forth and he says, well, it's true that most of them in America, they are not non-Jews, but nevertheless, you still have to contemplate whether or not being in the same ohel, being under the same ceiling with, with a corpse is a mutar or is it maybe prohibit, pro, <coughs> prohibited. Excuse me. And really this opens a whole topic of discussion, which the Gemara tells us, that in the, the Pasuk says a person cannot touch a dead body and um, also you cannot come in contact with them through an um, item which is a, uh, a conduit to Tum'ah and also you cannot be under the same ceiling with in the same ohel as a dead body now this definitely applies to the Jewish body does this apply to a non-Jewish person as well? That becomes a, a very large debate. And the halacha is Maran in Shulchan Aruch in Yuridas Manshin Ayin Bet. He writes that is Nachon is proper that the person should not come at the same in the same room with a corpse even if it's not a Jewish body. And the Roma writes the same thing, indicating that's not really, really Asur, but nevertheless it's something that you have to be careful with. So that's really the, the basic halakha. So can you now ask a person that I'm going to go to become a doctor, but I'm not going to touch the body. I'm just going to watch the other people in the, in the class basically do the dissection of the body, and I'm going to learn. So says Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, is not really, is not really mutar. He's of the opinion that this is not to be allowed, so therefore he is um, stringent. Now in Eretz Israel, we had several scheme, the leading post scheme of Eretz Israel, that each one of them for a different reason wanted to be lenient, not to touch, not to actually do the, the, the um, dissection of the body, but to be able to at least be in the same room and watch the other students and the professor perhaps do the dissection and you will learn. And their concepts really, um, thank you, came from a combination of different um, different post scheme, which some of them hold that the Tum'ah of the Kohanim nowadays, that everyone is, is Tameh, is not really an issue as much as it was before. And others, based on Rabbeinu Tam, they hold that maybe the, the severity of this, Midoraita, in a biblical level, was only in the time of the Beit HaMikdash that he had the service of the Beit HaMikdash. So Kohanim were, were accepted in the, in the service of the Beit HaMikdash, and they, therefore they were expected to be Tahor at all times. But nowadays, unfortunately, we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. Maybe the whole concept is not really biblical. 
and so on and so forth, different combinations. So really, if a person is a Kohen and wants to um, look into medicine, they should ask their local Orthodox rabbi and go through it. The majority of the, the, uh, the rabbinic body of the post scheme, they have been stringent in this and they do not allow it. But nevertheless, there are extenuating circumstances that one could perhaps take advantage of a kula, of a leniency, depending on what the case is. And then, obviously, it depends if you're in Eris Israel or in America, it makes a big difference because in Eris Israel, the majority of the, the, the dead bodies there are, you could assume that they are Jewish. Over here, you could certainly assume that the majority are from the Goyim and therefore perhaps have the, the um, more lenient, lenient opinion of being in the same room with the corpse, but nevertheless, you cannot really be touching it. Do you do a daddy on a Jewish body at all? Even a Jewish person, non Kohen? So if we, we're going to get to that. He, Dr. Dr. Zog is asking whether a person could um, dissect a Jewish body even if you're not a Kohen. So the answer is, in, in normal circumstances, no. Because there are two other issues with um, dealing with a dead Jewish body. The Gemara says in Masechet Abu Dazara on page 29 that it's Asur is prohibited to benefit from a dead body. Now, the Gemara does not really say whether or not this is Asur for Jewish bodies only, or maybe it's Asur even for for a non-Jewish person. Now, Maran Shulchan Aruch, going on your question, in an earlier Siman in Yuredea, in Siman Shin Memtet, which is chapter 349 in Shulchan Aruch, he says that it's Asur is prohibited to, to draw any benefit even from a non-Jewish corpse. Now this is based, if you take a look at the Bet Yosef, which is his, his book at length, that he explains all the dinim, he writes this based on a Rashba, in a responsum of the Rashba, in Shubot Rashba, that says it's Asur to use the body of a Goy and have any Hana'a from it. But the truth of the matter is, Maran did not have access to the Chidushim of the Rashba on, on Shas, and the Rashba himself contradicts himself, con con contradicts himself in his his commentary on the Talmud in Masechet Baba Kama and Daf Tet and the Tosafot there and Daf Yud write the same thing and this is mentioned in many earlier sources as well as early as the Yerushalmi in Masechet Shabbat and Perak Yud Halacha Hey clearly stating that this prohibition is only limited to a Jewish body not a, a not a non-Jew so therefore when 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 talking about you usage of the body, if they are Jewish, you have a prohibition aside from um, the, the, the one that we mentioned earlier, that you cannot draw any benefit from the dead. Now, is this, does this become mutar for the mitzvah, thank you, for, for surah mitzvah or not, that becomes a debate which is really um, beyond the scope of this talk, it becomes a more difficult and more complex din. But nevertheless, this and the third topic are very much relevant to our, to our questions as well. The third one is a concept called nivul hamet. You cannot disrespect a dead body. If you have someone that passed away, passed on, you can't kick them, you can't throw the body. You have to deal with the body with respect. Now, do you have this in um, do you have this within the um, Jewish or also non-Jewish community? That becomes debatable, but nevertheless, anything Rab Hankin writes, he was in America, Rab Moshe Feinstein held of him as the Rav of America, as the Gadol Ador, every Erev Yom Kippur, he used to go get a bracha from him, Rab Yosef Adyau Henkin, he was perhaps one of the, the uh, sharpest minds that we had in, in the past two generations in America, and he writes in his Teshuvot, that if you are dealing with with a body of a, a dead person in a way that is not impossible to be done even a, with a live person, then it's mutar. In other words, let's say you're taking a, a bone tissue 
and you want to use it for grafting later on, you could do that in a, in, 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 in a person that's alive too. You take from one place, you graft it to a different place, you use it for, for different, di different, different places, um, taking and using skin or bones from, from other places of the body. Therefore, he says that's not nivul hamet, that's not disgracing the body, and therefore it's mutar. And certainly, if you, you know, patch it up, you sew it, you basically stitch it up afterwards in a respectful way, that would be mutar. Now this happens to apply with many things. It's not just the um, the, the bones, the cornea implants, or nowadays any tissues that are used from the dead body. They, they're used on daily basis. Basically, I think the, there isn't a uh, dentistry that that you don't have this uh, implant bones that are that are used from um, cadavers nowadays in their in their office. Now these bones are pieces of a dead body. Do they have a tumor of, of, of met? Can you, if you're a Kohen, let's say if you're not even getting an implant, can you walk into the office of a dentist? And let's say if you could walk in, can you get one of those implants? Or if you are the Kohen yourself, and you're the doctor, you're, you're um, oral surgeon, or you're a pre periodontist, and, and so on, can you use those things um, in order to, to fix an implant in someone's mouth? Those becomes, become, become questions that, well, if you're not normally dealing with pikuach nefesh with, with implants, if something, if something is um, involving pikuach nefesh, not only saving a Jew Jewish life, but even a suffix of pikuach nefesh. Yeah, even if it's a very uh, far removed um, and, and stretched um, suffix of doubt of someone's life being in danger, is doche kola Torah kula. That pushes away any of the isurim. Now we're dealing only and solely with things that are not, a cornea implant is not pikuach nefesh. A, getting an implant in your mouth is not um, is not pikuach nefesh. So is it mutar or is it perhaps we have to go 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 to the old time dentures that they had uh, back in the day, which were made out of other other material. So now the halacha really is to say it and make it a little easier. The halacha is that's mutar. Now, why is it mutar? It really depends on few different halachic um, concepts that the combination of all of them together really give this halacha. First of all, the level of tum'ah that we are concerned about, even if you're talking about a, a Jewish dead body, is only etzem kaseora. The Mishnah says in Nazir, in Perak Zayin, and in, in Masechet Ohalot in Perak Bet, that the level, the size of a um, bone that would be, make a tum'ah is the volume of a seora, which is a barley. Anything less than that, you don't have to be concerned about by uh, by tumat kohanim. Now, this ones that you have, they are each one. I, I, if I'm if I'm mistaken, each one of them is the uh, size of a, a grain of salt. Uh, Several of them come in one one container of uh, you have different sizes of one gram to four grams, and um, they could they, they they could vary if if you want to be, to have a bigger implant, then you have to put them together and place them in. Which this becomes actually a machloke tanaim, a debate within the tana, tanaic sources in the Mishnah in Ohalot in chapter two Mishnah Zayin. There the the Mishnah discusses that Rabbi Akiva says if you have a bone that's large and you cut it up to different pieces, is that, now you have the two pieces together, but now the, it's not one piece, the two pieces. Is that Asur or Mutar? Rabbi Akiva says that's Asur. Rabbi Yochanan ben, ben, ben Nuri says it's, uh, it's, um, it's still, it becomes Mutar. Rambam paskins like Rabbi Akiva in the more stringent uh, view of the thing, and it's Asur. But nevertheless, in our case, they have ground up the bones in order to um, to make them go really with any DNA and any blood type and so on, so the process them is not the regular bone that you just took out of a dead body. It's a, pro a, a very heavily processed tissue, and in the process of of, of 
you know, crushing, grinding, and reconstructing it, basically you end up with different bones from different bodies in one little piece that you have. So all the pieces that you have in one little container, they're not coming from the same bone of the same person, but rather they, they could be from 10 different bodies and 10 different pieces of bone, which that already is clearly mentioned in the Rambam that does not have tuma. So therefore, for all practical purposes, a a dental imprint and so on, they are they are totally fine. Now, for a cornea implant, we still have a, a problem of, of benefiting from a dead body, which we mentioned that according to Maran, Shulchan Aruch, is still a problem even if it's a um, non-Jewish body, as we mentioned before, if you remember. So this the two chief rabbis in Israel, they gave a wonderful logic to be lenient, to, to have all of these implants, and it should not be still considered benefiting from corpse. Because even if it's not tameh, the bone that you're using, but still you're benefiting from it. You're having your implant stay in your mouth, or the cornea that you're getting, and you're benefiting from that, that dead body through, um, through the implant that you're getting. So how does that work? So Rabbi Unterman, Rabbi Yehuda Unterman, and also Rabbi Herzog, they both say the same. Um, they both say the same, same concept in halacha that this, after being attached to your body, is part of your limbs, is part of your body. So it's not considered the dead body anymore. And before that, you're not having any, you're not drawing any benefit from it. When you get the new cornea, and and then they have to patch it up for a day or two until it really heals, and then you could open in your eye, by that time it has already become a limb from your limbs, so therefore you're not benefiting from a dead body, now is a live part of the new person, new person, which again, this is going to have many ramifications in all the implants, the heart implant, all those things that you have nowadays, which are much larger, you know, in, in the 81, Rav Moshe Feinstein wrote that getting a heart, 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 heart implant is asur, a heart transplant rather, is, is, uh, is totally prohibited because most, more than 80% of people who get it, they die. This is an 81. Nowadays, this is a daily thing, you know, the, the, the heart transplants are um, much safer than they used to be two decades ago, three decades ago, and therefore, you know, benefiting, even if it was from a dead body, it's not really considered benefiting from a, a dead body. And this really is the, one of the major questions that you have in, um, in the implants in the, in the medical world nowadays. Now back to our, our questions, this was just, we deviated because of your, the doctor's question, but um, the, back to our, our own concept of, of visiting the, the sick in the hospital, can a Kohen visit the sick? So the, the Rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Mordechai Bresh, in his Shuvot in the second volume, in Siman Resh Tetvav, 216, he writes that the majority Majority of the sick people in America, first of all, are non-Jews, and secondly, most of the sick people don't die. So you could assume when you're walking into a hospital that at that moment there is no no dead body being transferred from the rooms and in, into the basement, which is where they keep them, and it's safe to go visit a, a sick person. Now, a Kohen himself that is sick, and he has to be basically in, in the hospital for several days. Whether or not they should they should be careful to always keep the door of the room closed which anyways happens nowadays in a normal normal uh, in a normal setting for other reasons. So the Nishmat Abraham, Rab Abraham Sofer Abraham, he writes in his, in his book in Sefer Nishmat Abraham that if you're talking about chutzlares in America, for instance, then it could be much more lenient. You don't have to really be that particular about the Tumat Ohel, but nevertheless, if you're in Eris Israel, then you have to be really particular to, to make sure to close the, the door to your room uh, as much as you can in every uh, opportunity that is possible for you to do it in order to prevent the the chance of perhaps coming in contact with the Tum'ah because if a dead body is, is, is found in the hospital, all the Tum'ah, anything that's in the same level, and even if it's not in the same level, Midra Banan at least, as the Shah explains, um, the, the Tum'ah, the soft Tum'ah said these are again very uh, very intricate laws of, of Tum'ah Vatara. We're not going into the details. You really need, this is like a... a uh, 
um, you know, is, is the very complex chokhmah by itself, which is very abstract, but nevertheless, in, you know, encapsulating it, in, in making it very easy and, and overly simplified, it could become a problem when doors are open and there is a corpse in, in, in one side of the hospital and your room could take the tumah as well. So therefore, he says to try to close the door if you're in Eretz Yisrael, but again in America, Baruch Hashem, we have the, the uh, luxury of being more lenient in this, in this item. Now, taking flights, it really depends on the material that the plane is made out of, and in about a decade from now, it could uh, the whole halacha could change. There is for those who are following this, there is a uh, an item. What's that? There's something coming up that uh, the cars, the motorcycles, the boats, the, and even the planes, but the ones um, that are on the bigger side, the heavier side, the the Boeing 787 and and, and the uh, the Airbus, the, the bigger ones are being made out of a material called uh, carbon fiber. Now carbon fiber is embedded in plastic material and uh, is very light and extremely strong. So this is not conduit to Tum'ah because it's, it's plastic and, uh, and it's embedded in plastic so therefore it would not transfer Tum'ah. But for time being the ones who are made out of aluminum it's a debate whether aluminum is a conduit to Tum'ah. So therefore, El Al, for instance, has instituted, I'm not sure, I'm not updated exactly to know if all of them, all, all the coffins are made like this, this or not, but the transferring um, coffins that they use are made out of plastic with a tefach on top of the, the body, between the body and the top of the coffin, which takes care of the Tum'ah. But nevertheless, if you don't have that, sitting on a plane, as a Kohen, an Elal flight, which normally speaking has one or two or three or more uh, bodies packed underneath it, going to Eretz Israel, it could be a very problematic thing, but there are ways to deal with it, which again, you'll discuss with your LOR, with your local Orthodox Abai, as, as to where, how to go about this. Now, in the Israeli flights, there was a issue with uh, flying over the, the cemetery in Hebron, which Rabbi Yashiv and others in the, in the Rabbanut, they came up with a very creative way to get around it, which really was accepted by a lot to work with it, really, in, in Haaretz, they wrote about this later on um, for those who, who follow those, those, those types of news but then afterwards um, they disagreed with it and they, it's now, nowadays it's not available. Why, basically what it was was that uh, a Kohen that was sitting in the plane would be given a certain container which was made very, very comfortably. It's not as bad as it sounds. And for that few minutes that they were over the, um, over the cemetery of Hebron, uh, the, the uh, proximity of that area, they would be placed in a plastic, um, in a plastic plastic container and that's basically why they shut it down afterwards because they they felt it was not a secure thing for for security reasons they they um, stopped having it so therefore now that we don't have the plastic containers for Kohanim um, you have to yeah you have to look at the route of your your um, your plane and and ask ask a question. The general senses nowadays is that they don't fly over over that area, and they, that was changed in order to accommodate the many Kohanim who fly with Elal. It became a business thing as well because Swiss airline and 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 and, and so on they became more popular. But that's again that's not for halachashur. That's for uh, for for a different time. So that really is the the concept of um, of. Now, a pregnant woman, a wife of a Kohen that has a baby in her stomach, pregnant, and uh, he, she wants to go to Eretz Israel and visit the Kivrei Tzadikim. Is she allowed to go or not? Maybe the baby is a boy. And therefore, if you go to, to the Beta Kivarot, the baby becomes Tameh. So, Rab Moshe Sternbach, uh, uh, among many others, this is already the Shach brings this in, in, in Shukran Aruch, based on earlier sources, it says it's Mutar. Why? Because maybe it's a girl, and even if it's not, uh, if it's not a girl, maybe it's a Nephil. So there's a concept in Halakha called Safek Sfeka, and because of this, this concept, Halachic 
a halachic concept of a devil's doubt, we allow that to, to happen. Now the question becomes, the be better question becomes, Rabbi, I have done an ultrasound and I know I'm having a boy. So now is it mutar for me to go to a cemetery or not, which becomes a much better question that's debated in halacha and perhaps many would tell you it's better to stay away from it, but nevertheless there are others who come up with more creative um, halachic loopholes to allow that as well, which again, if that's the case for you, uh, you're just setting off some alarms here that, that you should ask a question. Now I want to go back for the fi last five minutes to the concept that we started from. We deviated from our, our, our first topic to just show how many restrictions Hashem has put for the Kohanim in order that they should be special, in order that they should be unique and separate from the, the, the ways of the world to some extent. The truth of the matter is, us, the Torah says, Lo miru bechem, chashak Hashem, bachem Hashem, does not love you because you are many. Ki atem hameat mikol ha'amim, because you are the smallest of the nation. If you take a look, right after, in the statistics, right after the second temple's destruction, we had about 6 million Jews in the world. And we had about 12 million um, Chinese um, in the world at that time. And now you have, you know, and, and they have with all the population controls and, and burying their kids alive and killing and only one child and so on. Now they're up to almost um, one and a half, over two, one and a half billion people. So we should have had at least a billion Jews. We are still down to, or up to 14, 15 million Jews. So Hashem says, you're always going to be the smallest nation. Like Mark Twain writes, you know, he says, if, if my statistics are correct, the Jew, the Jew is one-fourth of a one percent of the population of the world. But the Roman em, em, Empire came and they, they took their torch up and they vanished and they disappeared. He writes it in a very beautiful way. I'm sure all of you, or most of you are familiar with the, the beautiful words of, of the Mark Twain. It says, but the Jew is always there. His power did not diminish you're not it did not fade, it's invincible. You're not going in there right now. It's You're always been there, it has always been there, it's there, and it's always going to be there. What is the secret of the Jew? Now the secret of the Jew really is this very concept that Hashem says, you are going to be always the smallest so that each one of you counts. Each one has to see himself as the ambassador of Hashem in the world. You see, it's like, it's like this, this, this uh, village that they had, um, ten, 10 Jewish families, the 10 Jews, every day they, they had minyan, they all had to come, and Baruch Hashem, Hashem uh, blessed them, they got the 11th family in the, in the village, and tomorrow morning, only the rabbi showed up, because each one of the other nine said, oh, I don't have to come anymore. But the Jewish people, each one of us, we don't have, uh, we're all actors, there's no one on the other side watching. The, Jew, the, the Goim are watching us. We're all on the scene. We, all of us, we are very much a part of Hashem's plan of Kiddush Hashem, of this great mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem. And we are being watched by the entire world as this little tiny strip of land that's small in New Jersey and is on the top front pages of the news all over the world in every, in every, um, in every generation, every year. And I want to tell you a story, share a story with you to show how little things could be tremendous Kiddush Hashem. For those of you who, who know who Puff Daddy was, you know, this was the, I think, the, the court case of the decade, or maybe two decades. It was one of the, the, the biggest of the um, celebrities and uh, rappers, and it was a very, very, very big case. He was uh, accused of a shooting in a club at night and so on and so forth. So his lawyer was Ben Brafman. So Ben Brafman was, um, is a Orthodox Jew, his brother is, is actually a rabbi and so on, and um, he told this guy, Puff Daddy, he said, look, I keep Shabbat, 
And therefore, you can't call me to discuss. We're going to have to discuss tons of things. And I can't speak on the phone on Shabbat. So therefore, let's make an emergency call uh, thing. Anything that comes as emergency, you fax me. This is my, my number. I keep it on, you know, especially on Shabbat for you. to. So they make this system. The first Shabbat after this, he sees a caller ID from this guy, from Puff Daddy. He's calling him, not just um, once or twice, for hours and hours and hours, the phone is ringing with this guy's number. And he says, I can't pick up. I'm, I'm true to my, I'm loyal and true to my, uh, to, to my beliefs and to my core thing. Doesn't pick up. After Shabbat, right away he calls him, say, I apologize, I realized you were trying to reach me, and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, I figured if it's an emergency, we made the system. He says, no, you don't understand. He says, why do you understand? He says, you won me $10,000. So he says, I bet with one of my friends that you are true to your core concepts of religion and you're not going to pick up the phone. He says, impossible. We made a bet, $10,000, and he took my phone and called you over and over and over, not giving up because he was going to lose $10,000, which he did. So that is Kiddush Hashem. And even bigger than that, the verdict came for Puff Daddy case, Erev Shabbat, on Friday afternoon, about an hour before Shabbat. The jury stood up and they announced five times, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. This was the case of the decade. You know, he was on news for, for weeks, every single day, and, and, and headlines of all of the, the newspapers, was interviewed and so on. And when such a thing happens, you have the entire press outside the court waiting. So he says, I came out with 200 reporters there. 200 reporters from all over the place. You begin to spoke and it was before Shabbat. So it says, I went up there by the, by the mic. I said, that you can this, this line that he made, he coined, basically made it to the front lines of some news, newspaper. It became all over the place. And he started getting calls from, from people, from Goim, how beautiful. This was a tremendous Kiddush Hashem. Months later, he gets an email from a lady he never knew. Says, I want you to know it was that I started keeping Shabbat, I want to keep Shabbat. She lived somewhere in the middle, uh, Midwest, of Nover, and she wanted to keep Shabbat. And the boss was giving her a hard time, especially in the winter time when the, the Shabbat comes early. And she took this, this newspaper with the coat from him and dropped it on the boss's table and said, from this Friday afternoon and on, I am going home early. And if you don't, if you give me trouble, I'm going to hide higher Ben Brathman. <laughs> and this is this you know, this is a beautiful thing that you never know one thing that one person does could have you know exponentially affect on, on communities on people and this is being the ambassador of Agadosh Baruch Hu. this is being the ambassador of, of the Almighty and we should look at ourselves our lives it says when when Moshe Rabbeinu comes down and he asks, so what do you want from us? What's the bottom line? Okay, 613, all of that, good and nice. But what's the bottom line? What do you want from us? Hashem says one sentence. V'atem tihuli mamlechet kohanim v'goi kadosh. Ele adivarim asher tadaber b'ni Yisrael. I want you to be, to me, a nation of priests and a holy nation. All of us are kohanim. All of us are in some way ambassadors of the Almighty in the world, people are looking at us, people are watching how we speak, how we walk, how we do business, how do we speak to the, to the teller in the, in the bank, or to the cashier at the supermarket, do we say hello, do we say good morning, do we say thank you? Those things in, in our generation are so important. Just like a Kohen has to be a person, must be a person, that everyone looks up to him. We also should be people who the, the Goyim are able to look up to us, say, I wish, I, I want to become like this. There was this student of mine that was walking. Um, he said this story to me actually on Shabbat afternoon. And an African-American lady stops him. He says, 
Um, where is the nearest Jewish school around here? So he says, why? He says, I want to send all my kids there. He says, are you converting? He says, no. He says, so what's the story? He says, I've seen that you guys are so ethical. You're so honest. You're so nice. And I want my kids to grow up like that. That by itself is Kiddush Hashem. When people get to see that this is a, a Israel Asher Bechait Pair, Hashem says, I want you to be in my nation. Avdiata Israel, you're my servant Israel, Asher Bechait Pair, that I am proud of you. Bezat Hashem, all of us should be Zochev to be Mamlechet Kohanim, the Goy Kadosh. Amen. Kin Hiratzon.